tw 20 years. You, you remember me when I still had hair. <laughs> mm. Your Majesty, thank you for this time. And we pray that you'll be glorified because whether it's academic or on a popular level, either way, we depend on your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, I'm talking today about miracle reports, their plausibility in the Gospels and Acts. Mostly I write commentaries, but sometimes a footnote grows. And this was originally a footnote in my Acts commentary. But I feel right uh, at home here at Talbot because I actually live right by Talbot Drive uh, in Kentucky, except we spell it wrong in Kentucky. <clears throat> I know this is a lectureship in New Testament, so you might think I would talk about some of my New Testament books, you know, that I might have lectured on Acts or something. But, uh, but miracles is also quite relevant. Miracle and exorcism accounts comprise over half of Mark's narrative before the Passion, and roughly one-fifth of the book of Acts. And they're a common reason for skeptics doubting the historicity of these works. So today, I'm addressing the question of the reality of miracles. Plus, Moyer Hubbard liked my IBR presentation on this a few years ago, and when I asked what he thought I should speak on, he suggested that this topic might be of interest, and I guess Clint would agree. So uh, they are wholly to blame for whatever I say. Some thinkers deny miracles because they deny that there are any credible eyewitnesses or sufficiently credible eyewitnesses for miracles. Now, this turns out to be a circular argument because they end up denying uh, the credibility of whatever witnesses come forth. But ironically, some of them should have known better. And I want to give just a few examples up front about some famous deniers uh, and then uh, try to give some case studies. But Ethan Allen was a deist. Uh, David Friedrich Strauss really had a major influence in New Testament studies, and Boltmann more recently. Ethan Allen was a deist, and in 1784, 1785, he wrote a pamphlet, Reason the Only Oracle of Man. It was not exactly a bestseller. Uh, it sold about 200 copies. But he said, in those parts of the world where learning and science have prevailed, miracles have ceased. But in, in those parts of it is our barbarous and ignorant, Miracles are still in vogue. Now, ironically, his grandson, Ethan O. Allen, became known for his ministry of healing in the 1800s. David Friedrich Strauss, he decided the gospel miracle stories must be legends. Now, there's an irony of this. He thought that they were legends. You don't have any credible eyewitness accounts for miracles. But it so happened that he had a friend named Edward Morica, who had a diagnosed spinal problem and therefore could walk only with great difficulty. And after Edward Morica spent some time with the German Lutheran pastor, Johann Christoph Blumhardt, who also was known for his ministry of praying for the sick, uh, Edward Morica was hiking in the mountains. And Strauss was very dismayed by this. He said, well, okay, he must have only been psychosomatically ill despite the diagnosed spinal problem. But you notice what he didn't say. He didn't say this cure was um, merely a matter of uh, legend that grew over generations of time, which is what he wanted to do with the New Testament because eyewitnesses never claim these sorts of things. Bultmann said that mature modern people don't believe in miracles. It's impossible to use the electric light and the telegraph and to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. <clears throat> he excludes from the modern world all traditional Jews, Christians, Muslims, traditional tribal religionists, spiritists, basically everybody but his uh, mid 20th century uh, Western academic elite. And I pointed this out to one of my professors who was uh, uh, the last remaining Boltmannian uh, at the school where I was doing my PhD and, and pointed out that it also excluded from the modern world two-thirds of the PhD students sitting around the table. And he said, Boltmann had his presuppositions, but you have your presuppositions too. I said, that's true. When I was an atheist, I didn't believe miracles could happen. Now that I'm a Christian, I do. But if we wanted to take a, a, an agnostic starting point, say maybe they happen, maybe they don't, 
Uh, here are some cases where I've seen people healed in answer to believing prayer, including myself. And if you want to challenge that, your next logical step will be to challenge my credibility as an eyewitness, whereupon he changed the subject. And the, um, yeah, which is kind of sort of the background of why I started thinking about this approach to miracles. Justo Gonzalez, citing Latino churches, says that what Boltmann declares to be impossible is not just possible, but even frequent in Latino churches. Hua Jung, the retired Methodist Bishop of Malaysia, says that Bultmann's issue is a Western one. It's not really relevant in Asia. Philip Jenkins, in his books for Oxford University Press about Christianity in the Global South, points out that Christianity in the Global South is quite interested in the immediate workings of the supernatural. And John S. Mbiti, who's often considered fairly liberal by African standards, said that when Western scholars dismiss the reality of spirits, they're just showing their ignorance of a reality with which they lack experience. Most of the deniers ultimately rest their argument on an argument that was posed by David Hume, uh, although they don't always recognize that that's where it goes back to. But David Hume is the one who popularized this. It actually goes back to some deists before Hume, uh, and, and Hume just kind of summarized it and actually left out some of the some of the material in between. But basically he argues that there's no genuinely credible eyewitnesses for miracles. And so of course, if anybody claims to be, then they are not really credible because it, it goes against uniform human experience. So you re reject well-supported eyewitness claims for miracles because we know miracles don't happen or at least can't be shown to happen why? Because we know that they don't happen because we don't have any credible witnesses for them. Um, that's a circular argument. And so he even gives an example of a, of a miracle story that was known in his day. Uh, how many of you have heard of Blaise Pascal? Um, for those of you who haven't, how many of you have heard of computers? <laughs> he, he's often considered the father of the modern computer. Anyway, Pascal's niece had a running eyesore, and uh, it, was, it was organic, it was publicly known, you could smell it uh, because of the foul odor that it, it emitted. And one day at a Jansenist monastery, she was touched with a holy thorn from Jesus' crown. Now, I don't know how many of you think it really was a holy thorn from Jesus' crown. Personally, I think Luther was probably right when he said there were enough um, nails from the Holy Cross to shoe every horse in Saxony. I mean, there were just a lot of, <laughs> a lot of relics floating around. But, uh, but it was a contact point for her faith, and she was instantly and publicly healed in front of many witnesses. And as a consequence, the Queen Mother of France sent her own physician to check it out, so it was medically documented. So how does Hume address this? Hume cites this example and responds, well, look, this is better documented than any miracle we have in the Bible. It's, it's medically documented, it was, it was public, we, we, we have the names of witnesses and so on. We know this didn't happen, so why would we believe anything else? Moves on to the next point. Uh, he could get away with that because nobody liked the Jansenists. There've been a number of recent major philosophic challenges to Hume on miracles, published by Cambridge, Cornell, Oxford, and, and so forth. The one that was published by Oxford, actually a reviewer complained, you just don't like Hume's argument on miracles because you're a Christian. To which the author responded, actually, I'm not a Christian. I just thought it was a bad argument. <laughs> are there some credible eyewitnesses for miracles today? Well, if we start from churches that are known for that emphasis, there have been major academic studies on global, and Pentecostal, uh, global Pentecostal and charismatic healing published by Oxford and others. There was a 2006 Pew Forum survey of Pentecostals and Charismatics in just 10 countries. So this is not the whole world, this is just 10 countries uh, in, in several continents. <clears throat> and if you take the figures and you add them up, for these countries alone, and for the Pentecostals and Protestant Charismatics in these countries alone, the estimated total of those who claim to be witnesses of divine healing comes out to somewhere around 200 million people. So, you know, if you say there's no credible eyewitnesses
for miracles, off the bat, you're dismissing 200 million people. And sure, some of them are not credible, but are we going to off the bat dismiss all of them before we, you know, is our, is our working premise? <clears throat> More surprising in the study, somewhere around 39% of other Christians, that is, people who are not Pentecostals or Protestant Charismatics, uh, so if, if any of you don't like Pentecostals or Charismatics, this is the rest of the people. Somewhere around 39% in this country claim to have witnessed divine healings. So we may be talking about somewhere around one-third of Christians worldwide who've witnessed what they believe to be divine healing. Now, people say, ah, well, that's not in the West. Some of them actually are in the West. There was a 2008 Pew Forum survey where 34% of Americans claim to have witnessed or experienced divine or supernatural healing. Now, this is not just limited to Christians. 30% uh, of Hindus claim that as well. Um, but the point is not what proportion of these claims involve generally divine activity or miracles. None of us, I think, would say that everybody who claims that something's a miracle, that necessarily makes it a miracle. But the point is whether Hume can legitimately start from the premise that uniform human experience excludes miracles when he hasn't even looked at any of these, well, he looked at Pascal and just dismissed that, uh, Pascal's niece, but you can't just start with the premise that uniform human experience excludes miracles and then work from that premise completely ignoring the fact that there are so many witnesses. I don't think even Hume would have tried to make that argument today given the, the evidence that we have. And it's not just people coming from Christian presuppositions, saying, okay, well, I got better, so it must have been a miracle. Millions of non-Christians have been convinced and changed centuries of ancestral beliefs, sometimes at great social cost to themselves because of extraordinary healings. So it wasn't just something like, well, this got, my headache got better, uh, and therefore I'll be a Christian you know, even though their headache got better a few years earlier and they didn't know anything about, about Christianity. China was not one of the countries in the above survey, but around the year 2000, one source from within the China Christian Council, which is affiliated with the Three Self Church, estimated that about half of all new conversions in the previous 20 years were due to what they deemed faith healing experiences. In the house churches, the estimate in, in at least one house church estimate that was given comes closer to 90% in the rural areas. Now, I, I can't verify, you know, it's this percent or that percent, but we're talking about a lot of people. And these were people who were not starting with Christian premises, not starting with a Christian background, and yet they became Christians because they were convinced that something so out of the ordinary had happened. Dr. Balkrishna Sharma, from Nepal estimates that 90% of the converts in Nepal are converted through healings or deliverance from demonic power. <clears throat> there was a study done in India in 1981, and they estimated that 10% of the non-Christians in Chennai, so these, these don't include the people who became Christians as a result of healings, but there were 10% of the non-Christians in Chennai who had been healed when somebody prayed for them in the name of Jesus. Now, I don't know how the survey was done, so I can't verify any of these statistics. All I can say is we're talking about, again, a lot of people. Um, just as a, an, as a couple examples of that, Pastor Israel was one of my past seminarians from India. He was doing a, a demon at the Baptist seminary where I used to teach. And through prayer for the sick, his Baptist church grew from a handful to about 600 people, mostly converts from Hinduism. Now, the reason I found out about this was just incidental. I came in one day at the, in the very room where this picture was taken, and I had a splitting headache. He said, oh, brother, let me pray for you. So he prayed. Nothing happened. And I said, it's because I don't have any faith. He said, no, brother, it doesn't work here. Everybody I pray for in India gets healed. Oh, but by the way, the headache has since gone away. <clears throat> he says, everybody I pray for in India gets healed. If you come to India and you pray for the sick, they'll get healed. Because God wants to lavish his love on these people who've never heard the good news or never understood the good news 
about his son, which isn't to say he doesn't want to lavish his love on us, but I mean, he does it in all sorts of other ways that we have available, including uh, medical technology and so on. But in any case, Jessie Jason, she's a professor in India. Um, she was telling me an account from when she was a child, 1980, when she was about nine years old, her father was planning a church among some, some workers. And even though he was of high office, which was a big issue in India, even though he was of high social station, he washed the leprous foot of a leper. And Selvan, that was the name of the leper, whom she and the family knew well, he returned healed the next day. And she, she gave me her eyewitness account of how one day it was leprous and the next day it was completely restored. It was just like baby skin on, on the foot. And so Selvan's family and many of the neighbors were converted. Uh, so I'm just giving you some examples now of people coming from non-Christian backgrounds because of what they witnessed. <clears throat> Douglas Norwood was a Moravian pastor. He was visiting Nickery, Suriname, where he describes to me that, you know, of course there are many Christians in Suriname, but among this one people group in Nickery, <clears throat> they had been laboring for centuries. There were just a couple hundred Christians. Um, and the churches were doing something that we would never do here in, in, in the United States. They were actually competing with each other for the same Christian members. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> so uh, he, uh, he was there with a number of the Christian, uh, the pastors, and they began to pray and repent of their divisions. And as they were pouring out their hearts to God, God poured out the Spirit on them. They, they went out and began to evangelize non-believers who were really shocked. They said, what's happened to these Christians? They never acted this way before. And the, uh, many of them gathered to the church that evening. And, and there was one man sitting right in the front on a, on a rug. And he was, he was defiantly challenging this, this Christian God while uh, Doug Norwood was, was speaking. And Doug, Doug also includes this in his Demen dissertation but I interviewed him on it and got some more details. The, the man was defying him. He said, I defy this Christian God. Now this man was, he thought about 80 years old and his uh, right arm had been paralyzed all his life. And as he's saying, I defy this Christian God, suddenly his hand shot up in the air. He looked at it, he was converted. <laughs> the other people around him looked at it and they were converted. And over the next few years, this sparked a people movement so that tens of thousands of people were converted to Christian faith, uh, starting with that. <clears throat> now, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of J.P. Moreland, <clears throat> but in a book, this, this is, my statistics are a little bit out of date because the book came out uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago or so, but J.P. Moreland points out that rapid evangelical growth that's been taking place in the last three decades, up to 70% of it has been intimately connected with signs and wonders. My observation is that not exclusively, by any means, God can do anything anywhere, but not exclusively, but most often, these dramatic signs happen especially in areas of groundbreaking evangelism in, in, in relatively new areas for the gospel. Now, again, James chapter five, you know, prayer for the sick. God can, God can heal us all sorts of ways. He can work through medicine, it's still an answer to prayer. He can heal us gradually, it's still an answer to prayer. But usually things like raising the dead and so on, not exclusively, again, I'll give you some other examples of it where it wasn't in groundbreaking areas. But most often that happens in areas where God is really working to get people's attention in groundbreaking evangelism. <clears throat> but this is, this is not a new, a new pattern. Many of the church fathers claim to be eyewitnesses of healings and exorcisms that were converting many polytheists. <clears throat> In fact, Ramsey McMullen, who doesn't sound very happy about it, but Ramsey McMullen, a Yale historian, points out that in the third and fourth centuries, the leading cause of conversion to Christianity was healings and exorcisms. <clears throat> and not to skip too much of church history, uh, but just for the sake of time, uh, of course, it brings out how Protestant I am, right? Because I skipped all of the Middle Ages. But anyway, <clears throat> the uh, a prominent feature of the Korean revival of the early, early 1900s, 
healings and exorcisms. You had uh, many Western missionaries in Korea who were like, uh, we know these things don't really happen. You know, and, and the spirits, you know, that's just psychological. There's no real spirits. <clears throat> so they commissioned a study, and many of the Western missionaries were converted to believing in the reality of healings and exorcisms through the, the ministry of this indigenous revival taking place in Korea. Well, how valuable is eyewitness testimony, despite what Hume says? It's a form of evidence in sociology, anthropology, law, journalism, and of course, what I deal with most, historiography. But one principle that I'm following in, in how I sift this is that a smaller number of eyewitnesses should count more heavily than a greater number of skeptical non-witnesses. We would apply this to most other kinds of claims. For example, if there's a traffic accident and the officer is interviewing witnesses, and someone comes along and says, wait, that's not what happened, don't listen to them. And the officer says, well, can you tell me what you saw happen? And the person says, well, nothing happened. I didn't see it happen, because I wasn't there. Normally, we wouldn't take that as a credible you know, uh, weight against witnesses, but when it comes to miracles, that's often what we do. Somebody says, well, I was miraculously healed. Well, I didn't see it, I don't believe it. Normally, if it's credible eyewitness, we're more willing to, to take their word for it. Now, I do need to introduce a theological caveat here so nobody misunderstands what I'm saying. I'm not claiming that everybody who gets prayed for gets healed. You can see I wear glasses, I have male pattern balding, <clears throat> and my students regularly comment that there's something else wrong with my head. Uh, but I'm going to cite some witnesses now, and because of where Hume uh, argues that there are no credible witnesses and some of the things he says about credibility I, I, where uh, in some of these cases I'll be mentioning this person has a PhD or something like that. Um, Wan Suk and Julie Ma, uh, at the time that, that they reported this, uh, Wan Suk was the director for the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. In fact, in the, in the lower picture, it's right after I talked about this uh, in a paper at Oxford, I'm, I'm, this was one of the examples that I gave regarding miracles, and then I just walked down the road where uh, they were at Oxford Center for Mission Studies, and that's where this picture was taken. But <clears throat> they, they report a number of miracles, and one of the ones that they report was a, a large toxic goiter that instantly disappeared, visibly disappeared during prayer. That's, that's an eyewitness claim. That's something you can tell by looking. You know, you don't ha even have to have a medical degree to see that, you know, here was big goiter and suddenly it's gone. Um, I, I was a witness of, of a case, uh, and my younger brother Chris was. <clears throat> in, in around 1983, there was a Fuller Seminarian. By the way, I'm not recommending to seminarians that you do this. Um, because if the Holy Spirit isn't in it, it would have been disastrous. But uh, I, was, I was helping at a nursing home Bible study, and the study was being led by uh, a student from Fuller, and there was this woman named Barbara, and she always said, I wish I could walk. I wish I could walk. And finally, one day at the Bible study, he walked over to her, said, I'm tired of this. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Took her by the hand, lifted her out of her wheelchair, and you could tell by the expression on her face that she was horrified. And I couldn't see my own face, but I know I was horrified. Um, so if it was psychosomatic, it wasn't her psycho. And uh, if faith is a bias, I can't be accused of it either. And he walked her around the room. And from then on, Barbara could walk. And as she came to the Bible study each week, she'd say, I love this Bible study. I love this Bible study. <laughs> uh, and, and Chris, by the way, my brother, is, is here in California, um, although he's, he's quite far north of here. But if you want to go ask him, he can, he can kind of tell you. He was younger than I was. But um, Another example of something fairly dramatic that, that did happen here in the West, Barbara Comiskey Snyder, doctors had sent her home to die. She had been deteriorating from a very severe form of multiple sclerosis for over 15 years. At this point, her diaphragm didn't work. 
so she couldn't breathe without being on a machine. She had a hole in her neck uh, for, for breathing uh, that, that also she could use to squeak out her voice if they took the breathing tube out. She was blind. She says she was curled up like a pretzel. And, and one day, uh, after a number of people had prayed for her, there was this prayer that went out on a Moody radio station to, to pray for her. Uh, and she didn't even know about it, I think, but uh, one day she heard a voice saying to her, rise up and walk. Now, her, her feet were all curled up. I mean, there was no way she could have stood on the ground, and there was also no way she could have used her muscles to get out of bed. But when she heard that, she didn't have time to stop and think about it. She jumped out of the bed. Then she noticed that she could see her feet flat on the ground. The next thing she noticed was that her, her hands were no longer curled up. And the next thing she noticed was that she was seeing all this and she was no longer blind. She, she ran to greet her father. And I consulted the doctor who was her doctor in this. And he, he verified the story and actually had written it up somewhere as well, which I also read. That was in 1981. She said no recurrence of it since. She's a, she's a pastor's wife today. Paul Mokaki was a, a demon student at the Baptist Seminary where I used to teach. And uh, he, he's from Cameroon. And there was another uh, Baptist student, a uh, NEMDIV student named Yolanda, who was visiting at a time when she saw him pray for, pray for someone and the person was... Uh, miraculously healed of blindness. And so I, I consulted Paul on it. He said, yeah, that happened. But he had so many other stories, you know, he hadn't, he hadn't bothered to tell me that one. I think uh, I better make this my last story for now and save others for, for uh, Thursday. But Greg Spencer had gone legally blind. He was actually 2,400 in one of his eyes at this point. Uh, I, blo I blocked out the, the names because um, HIPAA loss, but I have the original documentation. He was, he was legally blind. He'd already been through training for, for the blind. And he went to a retreat. It was for the healing of the mind. He wasn't even praying for the healing of his eyesight. But when the Lord granted the healing of his mind, the Lord gave him an extra gift too. He opened his eyes and he could see. Uh, and medical records, uh, a number of doctors confirmed the remarkable return of his visual acuity. He had to get all this checked out because he was on disability for his blindness. And he had to be able to verify that he was no longer blind. And the Social Security Administration wanted to investigate because this was macular degeneration, which doesn't just go away on its own. Well, uh, he was no longer qualified for disability. <clears throat> you know, there's a downside to everything. <clears throat> But we, we have all the medical records in his case. Ah, but do limbs ever grow back? Well, you have to come back on Thursday. <laughs> and we'll talk more about that. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.